Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Model, episode 76. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach, and it is fucking hot in here. Yeah, we're in our little sweat box here at my... Why is it so school. hot? I don't know. If we open the door, or even if we go in the goddamn bathroom next door, it's cool in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, studio god damn you it. know what i forgot about this i forgot how hard it is to record in the summer i remember this last year when we were doing these episodes in the summer and it was brutal but then when winter comes along it's much much more tolerable but yeah man i hope you people appreciate the sacrifices that we're making for you because i'm probably going to lose five pounds of water weight just sitting here recording <laughs> don't say you people you people oh yeah sorry i didn't mean it that way or did I? I mean, you jujitsu people. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So today we got an interesting topic. We want to talk about the fear of time. Now, the fear of time is formally known as chronophobia. This is different from chronometrophobia, which is the fear of time pieces. So we're not talking about being afraid of your watch. We're talking about being afraid of time itself. Now, a long time ago, I think back in the episodes where we were talking about anxiety, something that Matt mentioned was the fear of time and just this... That's my personal fear, by the way. Yeah, this overwhelming kind of sense of dread that you have that you're not making the most of your time, that you're wasting time, that you're not doing enough during the day. And I think everybody feels this. Now, it's, it sounds like a phobia for overachievers when you think about it. I think so. I don't know if this is consistent for everybody, but I'm going to guess that a good portion of our audience can relate to this topic, that just you always go to bed every night feeling that you haven't done enough. And I like to think of myself as a pretty metrics driven guy. I mean, I try to write stuff down and make sure I know what I need to do during the day. And it feels like I'm just, I'm never getting enough done. You know, I'll say I've got like five big things I want to do today and maybe I'll get one of them done if I'm lucky. Now, I don't know if this is just a side effect of people being too optimistic about what they can realistically do. And I don't know if this is a new phenomenon or something that's been around forever, but there's just so much noise these days. There's so many expectations on people for what they're supposed to get done. There's just so big a challenge to find quiet personal time to just relax. I feel like there's this constant overwhelming sense of like almost dread that just you're running out of time you're running out of time and I think that takes a toll on a lot of people and you know interestingly going into quarantine I was being told by <laughs> celebrities that I would have more time than ever and I could learn a skill or do something cool but I am busier than I have ever been you know if you think you're going to have any peace and quiet being locked in a house with a toddler all day <laughs> I, I can tell you from experience that is not the case so we wanted to talk about this because I think this is something that everyone can relate to. And if you don't take control of it, it can really impact your quality of life. And I think a lot of people probably don't even consciously think about the impact that this is having on them. And as jujitsu athletes, for a lot of the competitors out there, I would assume that this fear is even more pronounced because you only have a, a very short window to actually maximize what you want to get done competitively. I would assume that if your career is going to take place over a 10 or 15 year window, as as opposed to a 40 year window, you're going to have an even greater fear of time than you otherwise would. So let's talk about that today. Basically describe my fears. <laughs> yeah. The whole point of this episode is to give Matt nightmares yeah. or closure. Yeah. I, I always think like about our parents, um, who are boomers and like, did they have this? I mean, you know, for, for them, if you, when you get paid, you got your check, you'd have to go to the bank, deposit the check manually, um, can you imagine having that a, every fucking time where it's like deposit a check manually what a joke like now i can do uh i don't even need to spend any time even online i can get things directly deposited and i feel like i have less time than ever like where the fuck did that time go that used to used to exist to go to the bank it's it's funny it's like the more uh, technology and convenience based tools and products we have the busier we get because now we have more time to accomplish more. So we're expected to accomplish more. It's kind of a weird it paradox. Really, it really is. Like, you would think that having all of these incredible modern conveniences 
we would be able to just have a lot more time and just be relaxed. And wasn't that the utopian dream that people thought like the future would look like? You remember if you hear what people in the 1920s thought the year 2000 would look like, they thought we have like flying cars and robots would be doing all the work. And what's actually wound up happening is all of these great technical advancements have happened, but rather than giving us all of this great free time, that time has just been eaten up by other responsibilities. <laughs> and this is one of the interesting things, right? Like productivity uh, in modern countries has gone up and up and up and up. And the amount of productivity that one person can achieve during a day is ridiculous if you leverage all of these tools we have. Like anyone who runs a business knows what I'm talking about. And now that we've got things like AI, there's just so much that a single person can do. But rather than freeing up our time, that's actually just forced us to use that time to just take on other obligations. And I think we just have to do so much mental juggling now that it just becomes overwhelming. It's more than our brains were really meant to handle. Like we were meant to basically like, you know, wake up and go farm and hunt a saber tooth tiger. And, you know, the number of things we realistically needed to do during the day were pretty limited. But now there's so many variables required to live in modern life. And I feel like we just aren't equipped to juggle all of the things that our brain requires us to juggle. Well, I think, you know, you say something interesting there, how we're meant as humans, we're kind of meant to farm and work with our hands and hunt. And I don't actually know if that's true. It just seems like it should be. It's more of a figure of speech, but yeah, but yes, I mean, you know, if you, if you were to strip down all of the convenience food uh deliveries and things that we have mass food productions that we have, we would be growing our own food, gathering our own food, hunting for ourselves. Like if you think about us a uh, hundred years ago, yeah, a lot of us would be doing stuff like that. And what we have now is a situation where uh, everything is convenient. Everything is at our fingertips. And essentially what we're trying to do is work towards having a more comfortable life always. And it's funny because I'm at the point now where I don't even think that it's virtuous to to or not maybe not virtuous is the word but it's not really a good goal to have to have a comfortable life because the more comfortable your life becomes the more you start to nitpick things the less satisfaction I feel you get out of things like back in the day if you farmed the fields all day and and grew your own food and harvested your own food slaughtered your own animals worked with your hands like you really enjoyed the fruits of your labor like when you eat your dinner you know where it came from you knew the hard work and sweat and toil that went into it even though it took you all day and you could possibly live at peace um, but now everything is done for us we go to the store we can get anything at one store um, we come home, we have all these convenience devices where we don't have to spend time washing clothes by hand or washing dishes by hand. Uh, you know, we have, we have devices we can give our kids so that, uh, we can free up more free time for ourselves. Um, and I don't feel like I'm more comfortable or that I'm more satisfied or less afraid of time. I feel like if anything, I'm now creating situations where I have pockets of time where I need to accomplish more. I need, uh, because everything is so convenient, I feel like I need to do more and uh, it's never satisfying enough to do more. So it's funny how the more comfort that you seem to get, the more you seem to, at least, or sorry, I'm speaking on my own behalf, the more that I feel like I'm less satisfied with life. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And it's crazy when you think about it. But, you know, it wasn't that long ago that just doing the chores was basically such a big job that that was your entire life. It's like, like you said, you were responsible for going and getting your own food. You know, you had to raise the kids, you had to clean the laundry, and that would take your whole day every day for your entire life. And you know, that that was an interesting way to live compared to what we have now, where you can get most of those chores done in like 30 minutes a day, maybe an hour a day, right? Or and, set it and forget it. Like a yeah. lot of the machines we have now do a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And all of that convenience, I think the thought was that if we had all of this stuff automated and people didn't have to work, that we would get to live this utopian Star Trek life where we use all of the free time to just come up with these incredible achievements and explore the universe and be at peace. But I think what's actually wound up happening is we've just taken on more and more work. And instead of just having one or two relatively simple things to do during the day, we're juggling tons and tons and tons of things. And of course, in the modern economy, you know, you 
often need to have both people in a relationship working and that can be challenging when you've got the kids. So there's so many variables that the average person has to deal with in a given day. I just feel like it's kind of hard to just keep all of that going in your head and that results in this feeling where you just feel like you're never getting enough done. Now granted, I'm I'm not a historian, I'm not a psychologist, but I wonder if 200 years ago, was this a problem that people had? Now granted, back then they had a series of totally different problems that I would personally not want, <laughs> but, yeah. but you have to wonder if back then did people kind of live a, a simpler life and were they, were they happier as a result of it? Um, I feel like a return to simplicity is maybe something that we need to approach as a society. And I know I'm not the only person who's thought of this. I mean, there's a lot of books now that have come out on the topic. Like there's this book that I've been thinking about reading. I haven't read it yet called Bored and Brilliant. And it basically talks about the importance of having time just to be bored, to be with yourself. Especially for kids. Yeah, yeah. And how important that is for kids. I think the challenge is that being alone with nothing but your thoughts is kind of scary if if you're not used to it, right? It's easy to fill all of that headspace with devices and media. And there's so much of it. And so much of that stuff is high quality, right? There's a lot of great media out there to consume. But I think that taking time to just be back and be alone with your thoughts is just so critical. And that's something that I feel like we just don't have time for these days. Yeah, like everything is is hustle and bustle now, um, and it feels like we have the ability to accomplish so much because of all the convenience based things that we have set up. So, a lot of the time, you know, if you're not working, you're kind of wasting time. And like you said, now we live in a time where usually both parents of the household work. So it means that someone's got to go pick up the kids from daycare. You both are working. Then you have to get dinner on the table. Then in an ideal world, you would both have time to exercise, which is not realistic. Then you'd have both times to, uh, you'd both have time to pursue personal, uh, you know, interests and hobbies and things like that. Like those are crucial things for happiness, I think, and, and, and to make your life full of meaning. And if you, if you deny that, then, you know, it's just, your day is completely a blur. And I've done that work in two jobs where it's like, at the end of the day, you know, you didn't even sit down at all. Um, and you're exhausted and you've only got five hours to sleep until you got to wake up again. And it's just like, not really a way to live. Um, and, and time is sort of passing you by. So, um, I'll definitely say that since I, since I quit my other job and I only have to worry about my gym, it's been definitely, it's eased my mind because I have time. That's one of the reasons because I have time to be bored now and have time to actually like, you know, write down my thoughts if I have things that I want to work on or if I want to study jujitsu, I can do that for, for a half hour, an hour or whatever. Whereas before that just did not exist. So it could be the constant hustle and bustles in our, in our lives that is just like, there's never any time to rest. There's never any time to think. And you can see this with parents who put their kids in so many activities that the, the kids just want to, you know, sit on the couch or go out and play in the woods or whatever for, for, for a night or a day. Like I remember when I was a kid, um, I would just play like street hockey till all hours of the day, just all, it would be nighttime. And and then finally we'd go home. Whereas now it's like kids are in sports. They've got tons of things going on. Well, not right now, (laughs) but usually there's tons of activities for kids now. And a lot of these kids don't even have time to, to really be bored and to do nothing. Yeah. And I got to wonder if the modern society we live in amplifies a lot of the problems that would otherwise have been there before. Like, for example, you know, when our parents grew up, surely there was a hedonic treadmill. You know, you're looking at the neighbors, you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. You know, you're always kind of want you want to have the best house. You want to have the, you know, they're just the best kids, the best family, everything, right? But I feel like with the advent of social media, that may be amplified even further because you can't even open up your feed without seeing all of these like very carefully curated and edited photos of like beautiful people and the perfect family and the perfect job. And that gives you a very, very slanted lens with which to look at other people's lives to the point where you feel like that's normal. And then you're rough on yourself for not having accomplished that. And then that just further plays into the fear of time. And you feel Definitely like you feel point. like you're pressured to keep up with all of these people 
people who live these perfect lives online. And I think that's a big part of where this fear comes from. You know, I, th- I think a lot of it is just the fear of or, or the, the feeling that you need to compete with others rather than just being happy with who you are and what your family is. And I think that that's probably a big part of where this fear of time comes from is that it just feels like there's not enough time to catch up to where other people are at. So because of like things like social media and because we're so connected and we can see into our proverbial neighbor's backyard and see sort of how, quote, happy they're doing and we're comparing ourselves to other people's happiness, that could be a big reason why we are... Uh, unsatisfied and feel like we're always behind? I think maybe it is, right? I mean, I think that maybe moving away from simplicity and just flooding our heads with this very, very slanted view of the world has kind of created a situation where we expect ourselves to be doing more than we reasonably can, right? We're not comfortable just doing enough and having enough. We feel like there's this constant pressure to just be more, to do more. I mean, in in my industry, they call that hustle porn, right? Where people brag about how hard they work and how much they hustle. And is that really a virtue? Like, yes, you definitely want to be motivated and you definitely want to hustle. But do you really want to celebrate the fact that you're killing yourself, right? That is an interesting question because on one hand, great things come out of people being motivated. But on the other hand, I feel like it's kind of a dysfunction if you're just, you're constantly afraid of time yeah i think it's just a i think it's like a dichotomy you have to balance between being productive and also enjoying you know stopping and smelling the roses as they say like if you're just all work and no play then your life is going to fly by and you can't take money with you you know like when you die you're dead so um that's why i've always sort of geared my careers towards passions rather than uh how can i make the most money And really, I think things that you could do if you are afraid of time passing you by are ask yourself, how can you really make more of your time for yourself? And rather than, oh, I need to I need to make money. I need to uh, I need to do this. I need to do that. Think about like, okay, what will make me happy? What even if it's just lying on the couch for a few hours and just relaxing, you know, that can be that can be something that can really make your headspace (laughs) a lot healthier especially if you're just constantly running around and it's easier said than done because let's be honest not everyone is in our situation not everyone has the ability to to do this i've been in that situation where you're just constantly running around and it's it's exhausting so really how to make more of your free time or sorry how to make more free time is kind of an equation i think that needs some attention in in a lot of people's lives. Yeah, and i think that it's important to understand that free time doesn't always mean just inserting more stimulation. And again, we've got this incredible library of content out there in terms of like movies, music, video games, books. There is no shortage of awesome stuff to experience, but there's something to be said about just having a quiet moment where you're not stuffing more stuff into your brain. And I know that when a lot of people have me time, what they wind up doing is just putting on the TV, playing a game, reading a book. There's value to just doing nothing. (laughs) And as a parent, Matt, I'm sure you can relate. You know, it's something that I never would have thought of as being particularly appealing when I was younger. But now, sometimes I just want to like go home and sit on the couch and stare at the ceiling for 30 minutes. (laughs) That sounds like heaven to me, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Especially when you're really busy, your brain just hurts sometimes. Um, I think a good thing you can do is like get up earlier. That's that helps me because, uh, you know, if you're one of those people that sleeps in till nine, which is pretty late uh, or even later, you know, you're probably missing out on some crucial hours that you could just enjoy your morning or be with your kids or that's when I like to write or, you know whatever you're going to do, study, study an instructional, listen to a podcast. There's something about getting up early, even though it is difficult, it takes discipline to get your ass out of bed. There's something about those few extra hours in the morning that just makes your day seem so much longer. Um, I think also coming to terms with just understanding that time is uncontrollable. Like it's something that as humans, we have no control over. Um, like we'll never be able to slow it down or stop it. Well, we clearly can't... you have not seen the movie Interstellar, my friend. I have seen it. I, I, I don't know how that's a scientific part of this discussion. Well, because... He looked through the bookcase of stars. And well, because on Miller's sense. planet, he can like manipulate... Star... You know what? Fuck that movie. Let's not even waste our time <laughs> We're talking talk about, about gravity too. <laughs> like... 
<laughs> when Sandra Bullock went from the Chinese space station to the Russian space station. And, Spoilers, jeez. Yeah. Spoiling a like the best five year old ever. Movie. You know what? I, I haven't seen that, but I remember. So it's funny because I remember seeing the ratings for that, and people were raving about that. But then oh, ev- God, everyone God. I know who went to actually see it, they were like. This movie sucked. <laughs> so I, suck. I never it bothered horrible. actually getting around to see it. But anyway, we were talking about Fear of Time. Right, right, right. What were we talking about again? Who knows? Well, one thing that I find helpful, again, is rather than just using your free time to stuff more stuff into your brain is to just be mindful in the moment, right? That's why I think there's this big movement towards like yeah. meditation and mindfulness is because it encourages you to slow down. And I think there's a lot of benefit in slowing down and just intentionally being present. I think that helps a lot, especially when we always feel like we must be in such a rush. And just learning to be happy in the present moment and accepting what you have and not stressing over where you think you should be. I think it really, really helps. Um, I definitely recommend that people just get some practice being present rather than trying to basically fill the void. I think that's the mistake a lot of people make is they've got free time. So they throw in more stimulation, like, you know, they, they pull out the phone or whatever. And although that's a great way of passing time, it's not really a great way of enjoying time. Yeah, it's also like today I was just reminiscing about back in high school and I was like, holy shit, like I've been alive 32 years now. That was what, like 12 years ago, 13 years ago. That's crazy to think about. Like that's Mm -hmm. almost half of my life ago that I was in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, where's the time go, right? If you think about it that way, it kind of drives you mad a little bit because you realize A, how fast time travels and B, how little control you have over that. And, yeah. and so it becomes a matter of instead of slowing things down and, uh, you know, wishing you could stop time, it's more about just enjoying things you have and uh, appreciating, like what you said, what you have. That's that's a, a big part of how I sort of cope with with my fear of time passing. It's also I know before I know it, I'll be fucking 40. <laughs> it's also kind of maddening how some things like it feels like it was just yesterday that it happened but actually it was like years and years and years and years ago you know like it doesn't feel like that long ago that we were in high school but it was ages ago but then there's other things that like you think oh that you know that probably happened like a month or so ago but then you look back and like wikipedia and you realize it happened like 10 years ago <laughs> do you ever get that yeah, i get oh that yeah. a lot oh yeah where someone i just had this conversation about like when um robin williams died and i thought that was like two years ago no that was a long time ago know, relatively speaking um but it's interesting how the human mind just perceives time in this very weird way and that can lead to these situations where when you reminisce on the past you can get anxiety because you feel like you've wasted time but whether or not your time is wasted is a complete perception right that's just a that's just a value that you've put on yourself relative to some perceived ideal that may not even be relevant right it that's just a complete self-judgment and it may not even be a valid self-judgment so it can be i think dangerous to get too anxious about lost time and what's happened in the past i think that and and again of course focusing on the future and obsessing over the future can also have its own perils and i think that's why really enjoying the present moment which is ultimately the only thing we actually have i think that's why that's so important to actually do and to focus on enjoying where you are and what you're doing right now yeah one thing that i realized um in my cooking career was because time management is super important like you have to coordinate a bunch of different food items all at once uh and if you're doing a banquet for like hundreds of people it's really important that you know, the green vegetables are done last and the potatoes are done first. And Gotta watch out for those green vegetables, man. <laughs> they turn brown real quick. Yeah. It takes coordination. It takes to the second coordination and planning. And what I realized is under such strict time management practices, you end up obsessing over time in a way that you have to plan out every minute of your day and uh planning out every minute for of your day sounds extremely efficient and logical which it is but at the same time you start to fear the clock uh Mm -hmm. and and when i i found that when i was even when i was done my job and i'd leave for the day uh, that habit carried over into normal life so 
you know, I would have to catch the train to come back into Poco and then and then get ready to go teach class. It's like, I have to be here at this time and then I have to be here at this time. And then I, and I would always have to plan things steps ahead. And what it essentially means is that I don't have any surprises left in life. Like I can't, I can't just f uh, go through life freely. Every It's almost like I'm trapped in a prison where everything has to be planned to the most minute detail. And I still use these skills when I cook and when I coordinate dinners and things like that. But I've really had to struggle to work hard to uh, shut that part of my brain off at times so I can actually just enjoy life rather than focus on planning out every single second of life, which is something that cooks, it, well, if you're an effective cook, something that cooks do. You if know, you're a shitty cook, you probably aren't good at that. It's funny. It reminds me of all of these white belts who mail us every once in a while or that I see on social media who have like mapped out their entire jujitsu game using like these <laughs> crazy Excel spreadsheets. And I'm thinking to myself, like, if you put all of that time into actually training, you would have got a much better return on investment. most likely. <laughs> yes. uh, and I, I see this too, right? Because generally my tendency is to try to plan and be organized, but the side effect is you can wind up spending so much of your time just planning and organizing that you're actually losing time doing all of that administrative work. Totally. Um, but also it, it's like it, it's like you say, you turn your life into a checklist, basically, because exactly. it's like, here's really all of the well things put. I, here's all of the things I got to do today. To, at the end of the day, did I get all of the things checked off? Yes or no. And you're going to feel bad if you didn't. And on one hand, I'm not going to lie. Like it's a very useful productivity tool to be oh, able to do that. Efficient. But on the other hand, it turn it makes your life robotic and you, yeah. I feel like you got to figure out a way to add a little bit more spontaneity back into it and to ultimately also align back on the bigger picture. Because the other problem too, is if you get really granular about like timesheets and checklists and stuff like that, you run the risk of getting so focused on getting the little things done that you forget about the big things. I mean, I see this a lot at work where people might technically check off everything they were supposed to do. But if you look at the big picture, if you look at the like one, two, three, four, five year plan, they actually didn't get anything meaningful done. <laughs> yeah. They were so focused on the minutia that they didn't actually hit any of the big items that would have made a big difference. So yeah. on one hand, these tools are valuable and focusing on the details and planning can help, but they can also be a trap because they can trick you into getting on a hamster wheel that you can't then get back off of later. Yeah, you make some really good points there. Like basically cooks need time management and cooks live off of lists, whether it's mm -hmm. prep lists, uh, banquet Mo order lists. You Most know. challenging jobs do, right? Like if you've got a lot on the go, you're going to need some sort of organizational device. But the question is, who is serving who? Like, is that yeah. device there to serve you or do you wind up serving the device? Totally true. And, you know, I, I had it written down in my notes here, like, because we, we were brainstorming before the show. So what are some antidotes to chronophobia? And I wrote down spending more time with your kids, but I'm actually not quite sure that that is something because... <laughs> I was going to say, have you met my daughter? Because let me tell you, like, I love her. But after like about an hour of her asking me to like throw the ball with her or something, it does kind of grate on you. Yeah. Here, take this fucking iPad. No, uh, but, but like my point is like, uh, and this will usually happen when I'm talking to my daughter in at night, but it's like kids are like the hap. Okay. I, I love this quote. The happiest, the happiest part of having kids is watching them grow. And the saddest part is watching them grow. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, I'm, right now my son is like 11 months old. Um, and I remember when he was fresh, you know, he just, just brand <laughs> now, new now he's stale. Yeah. Now he's, well, no, now, now he's inflated. Now he's actually plumped up. Oh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's blimped. filled up. He's blimped. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but like, you know, I look at my daughter and then I look, I, I, I'll look back to Facebook memories or pictures from a year ago. I'll be like, holy shit, that was a year ago. Like I can remember yeah. that day. I can, I can physically see years pass me by and see how she's growing and how that, that little girl who could barely say any words is now basically gone and now i have a new little girl and in another year the girl i have today is gone and i have a new girl and yeah. it's like a really weird mortal feeling that wow life is passing me by at such a quick rate i just wish that i could slow it down and sort of like bottle it but there's no way to do that there's no way i know that like like right now, my my daughter got to find the space library, man. <laughs> I know we, we really need to get McConaughey to give us the hook up to that space shelf. Um, but I know, like you know, my, my daughter when I talk to her, she's like, "Come, come, cuddle, daddy, two minutes, come cuddle." I'm like, oh, "Okay, okay." And then I remember, like, there's gonna come a time when she doesn't want anything to do with me. 
<laughs> I'm like, that's going to be really depressing when those days come. And like, yeah. my son isn't at that level yet, but it, it'll, the same thing will happen to him too. You know, he, they're going to want independence. And, mm-hmm. and then you really realize like, wow, our parents, uh, they like, you see what they went through. Like mm-hmm. they must've felt these feelings too. I think every parent does. I remember, um, I took my daughter over to my mother-in-law's place and she had a friend over who was kind of talking about her experience with kids. And she was you know, I was asking, like, what is it like when they become a teenager and stuff? Is it just like a phase they go through? And she was saying, well, what happens is, you know, you have this kid and they're this cute little kid and then they grow up and they become a teenager and you think to yourself, oh, well, you know, when they get through this phase, it'll go back to the way it was. And it never does. Like, that, it, it's not that it, it's not that that's a bad thing. It's just they grow up into an adult and it's different. It's new. It's, you know, you're never going to be able to wind back the clock and make them a kid again. That time is gone and it's past. And it, God, that's fucking sad. Well, but, but is it though? <laughs> is, is it though, right? Is that's ju- That is just absolutely uh, a mindset. Like on one hand, it's sad that you can never go back. But on the other hand, think about what the future holds, right? You know, you've grown this child into an adult who is now able to actually go and deliver value into the world and, you know, uh, you know, and provide for the next generation. Like that's something to celebrate, but it's possible to get stuck in your own head to the point where you're so obsessed with the past that you're not living in the present. And I think that's even sadder than the fact that, you know, your kid has grown up. So I don't, I don't know, man, it's a, it's a tricky and it's a stressful thing for sure to feel like you're losing time, especially because like you said, the brain plays tricks on you with time, yeah. you know, things that, especially when you're a parent, things that were three years ago, feels like it was a day ago sometimes. Uh, so your brain plays tricks on you for sure. But I think that one of the best antidotes for that is just to enjoy the present uh, because, you know, obsessing over the past takes away your ability to do that. Yeah. Something that I would suggest if you're experiencing fear of time, the best resource I've found on that is How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. It's a very famous book. This is the same guy who wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he talks about compartmentalization in his book. Uh, the way he describes it is, you know how in like a submarine, you've got all of these waterproof rooms and the idea being that like a one of the rooms blows and gets filled with water, then nothing gets through the barrier to the other room. So that everything is compartmentalized. He talks about like trying to live your life in, instead of watertight compartments like that, in daytight compartments. So you, when you wake up in the morning, you live that day. And right through to the end of that day, you live that day. You focus on enjoying that day and being in the moment with that day. You don't worry about what happened in the past. You don't Mm -hmm. worry about what's happening in the future. You focus on the present. Very Mm -hmm. hard to do. Takes a lot of training. But if you can do that, that's one of the best ways to get past the anxiety that comes with fear of time. And again, that comes down to kind of like mindfulness as part of that strategy. Yeah. And I think, I think appreciating what you have in front of you is a huge part of that too. And like knowing when you have enough to feel satisfied and stop and enjoy the, uh, you know, smell the roses. Cause it, like you said, if you're always, if you're worrying about something that's a month away or months away or a week away, then you're not focusing on the time that you have right now. You're literally stressing about something that you have no control over. It's like, uh, it's again, always referencing my past career, but like, I remember, uh, you know, we'd be in the banquets and then we'd see all the banquet order forms for the upcoming week. And it would just be like a stack, like a giant sheet of banquets and functions coming up. And it's like, it just, you can feel your blood start to pound and your anxiety happening. Cause you're like, man, those days are going to be hard. Those days are going to be really hard. You know, we're going to, all hands are going to be on deck and it's going to be tons of prep and tons of work. It's like, why are we stressing about that today? That doesn't, that's not productive. It doesn't help me at all. All it does is it builds up my anxiety and makes me dread the future, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then, and then, you know, you come in, the work gets done. And then before you know it, you're look you're looking behind you like, oh, well, we got all that done. What's next, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting how anxiety about the future and obsession over the past can take you out of enjoying the present moment. I mean, I remember someone I know once was there and was coaching someone else and something really bad happened and the person was obsessed about what had happened. And uh, this guy said, look, it's done. It happened. Like, that's it. We need to come to terms with the fact that this happened. Let's move on. Let's not even talk about it anymore. What's the next step? How do we fix this? And this is good advice I've heard on how to deal with kind of that obsessive worry over lost time or mistakes made or something that's coming up is like, look, if you're worrying about something, ask yourself a question. Can you do something about it right now? Yes or no? If yes, 
then do that thing. <laughs> if no, then don't worry about it. Easier said than done again, but that kind of little mental flow chart helps a lot because there's no point worrying about something that you can't do anything about. And if you can do something about it and it's actually that big a deal that is worth worrying about, then do something and at least you'll feel better that you did something. Yeah. And on top of that, uh, something actually my wife told me once was, um, you know, if you're worrying about something or a mistake you made or, you know, you missed a deadline or whatever is asking yourself, you know, will this matter in a year? Will Mm -hmm. this matter in three years? Will this matter in five years? A lot of the time it won't matter at all. And it'll just be you obsessing over, uh, you know, especially if you're a perfectionist, which a lot of like overachieving, hardworking people are. If you're a perfectionist, then the mistakes eat at you, like they keep you up at night. And that's also not good because you have to forgive yourself for making mistakes. And you, like you said, if you can do something about it now, you can do it. If not, you, you, you have to move on. You have to, you know, and, yeah. and you know, who, you know, who else can control time is Nicolas Cage from that movie next. I don't think he could really control it. He could just see all possible outcomes, except for the outcome that that movie was shit. He wasn't able to see that outcome at all. If if I had to name the worst movie I've ever seen, that's the one. There's at the end, he like (laughs) dies and then he like, and then it does the, the corny thing where it goes back and he's like, oh, like I know where that that guy with the gun was and then he goes back in time and he fucking deals with him then he goes back in time like until he gets it right (laughs) it's the fucking worst movie i've ever seen i think the worst movie i've ever seen was scary movie 2 and i actually i'm not even sure i can include that because it was so bad that after 10 minutes i stopped watching yeah but you know what the best movie was was interstellar (laughs) (laughs) that's not even the best mcconaughey movie no it's not Uh, although i really did like it anyway uh, what you brought up is actually a really good suggestion if you're worrying about something. I remember someone did this to me when I was back in school. I was really bummed out that an exam didn't go the way that I want. And this guy just said like, look, 10 years from now, that exam isn't going to matter at all. Like you're worrying about something that actually isn't important at all. And that's actually a strategy that comes from Susie Welch, who is the uh, wife of the famous CEO, Jack Welch. And she wrote a book called 10, 10, 10. And what she basically says is when you're faced with the decision, determine the consequences in 10 minutes, then to 10 months, and then in 10 years, like ask yourself, if you've got this decision, What are the consequences going to be in that time period? And if you ask yourself that, a lot of the time you'll probably find that for the things that you're really obsessing about, they're mostly inconsequential. You're just denying yourself the enjoyment of living your life because you're worrying about something that doesn't matter. But if it's something that does matter, awesome, then do something about it, right? At least take action on it rather than worrying about it, which is not productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very well put. I want to go watch Interstellar again. God, hope you have (laughs) fucking four hours. Um, Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when I go into a jujitsu tournament and I see people preparing for jujitsu tournaments. It's about time we brought this shit back around. Oh, yeah, we're talking about this is about jujitsu. And I see people like uh, stressing so much, like especially like white belts. They stress about their first competitions. It's totally normal, too. And, And I'm always like, hey, just so you know, like, no, whether you win or loss, nobody cares. Like, just so you know, including, I know it, yeah, including I know it, you, like you it, won't even care in yeah. a few years. I know it means a lot right now. Trust me, nobody cares. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it sounds harsh, but it's like the, the truest, most brutal feedback you can get. It's like not even the fact that they're white belts and that they're at the lowest level of competition, but it's like whether you win or loss, no one really cares how you did in your last tournament. Like there's always another tournament. There's mm-hmm. always another chance to prove to yourself that you're good or or that you can improve yourself better than last time or whatever. Like I don't look at tournaments as as absolutes like I need to I need to win this or else people will think X of me. It's more like, well, this is this is a test that I can use to to measure myself against some of the best. And if I lose what I can do is I can learn from it. What doesn't matter is what people will think of me in the future. It mm-hmm. does. It really nobody cares, you know, unless this is like ADCC worlds. Uh, nobody cares. And even then, does anyone really care? Like there's so many freaking matches in ADCC. Most people probably can't remember the vast majority of them. If you're so caught up in people remembering your failures, then, you know, first of all, it makes it much more likely that you're actually going to fail because you're taking your mind out of the game. But also on top of that, it just generally decreases the quality of your life across the board. Yes, it does. Yeah. So enjoy life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, one strategy I found that we've talked about it before for just generally dealing with this kind of anxiety is Kaizen because you basically set this rule that no matter what happens, 
you know, I set a plan for what I want to do. I do it. And then I ask myself, like, what went well? What didn't? What do I want to change next time? And then I go through that cycle again the next time. And that way I feel like no matter what happens, I don't need to be anxious because I did my best and I have a plan for getting better the next time. So as long as I'm continually moving in a positive direction, that's the most important thing, right? Versus any one individual challenge that can come up. So I've personally found that to be a good way to reduce the anxiety that comes with chronophobia simply because It gives you like a a circle that you can use to continuously improve and feel like even in your failures, you're achieving something and you're getting better. Yeah. And you can measure how you're improving yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you can look back and say, oh, well, I'm way better at this now than I was back then. Or I've gained this skill or this knowledge now when I didn't have it back then. So it's like if you're always constantly improving yourself, then as the mathematical equation is time plus Kaizen equals constant improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's a constant series of getting better and better and better. And that's the best way to ultimately achieve a goal because as we've talked about before, if your goals are one and done, you know, you're going to be really depressed if you don't hit that height. Really a better mindset is just to be focused on continual improvement. That's really the best way over time to have serious gains. Yeah, that's how you get swole. Speaking of time, we've spent a shit ton of time in here recording. Yeah. Yeah. We did three episodes back to back. So in this like hot box in here, it's ridiculous. My Although, taint is laden with sweat and yeast. I think it's uh, cooling down a little bit, actually. We could bang out like five more or we could also go home and see our kids. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's funny you mentioned... Enough of that lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because like in terms of the best time of my day like one of my favorite times is when I put my daughter to bed and she kind of like sleeps on my tummy for a bit I just sit there on the couch cuddling her for like 30 minutes sometimes and that's like the best time of my day oh god it's the best because I don't have to I don't have to think about anything I don't have anything to do I just sit there you know back before quarantine (laughs) in the old days when we could actually go outside (laughs) back before jujitsu was illegal yeah one of the things I didn't realize was how much I enjoyed my morning commute because on paper your commute sounds like it sucks right you know it's oh I hate my commute but in reality relax time (laughs) yeah in reality that's the time where I got to just like sit there and have my coffee and read a book or read the news and having lost that now like the other thing that I actually found kind of relaxing was doing like going to get the groceries because it was kind of mindless you know you just go out you put on an audio book and you listen to something and off you go now I don't commute to work so I've lost that outlet and now buying groceries has become the most stressful experience you could possibly <laughs> people are literally thinking about killing you <laughs> yeah. or running away from you yeah. so it, it's a totally different ball game and having lost those quiet moments in my life Every other moment of my life requires me to be focused on something or juggling something. And I find, as we've talked about in prior episodes, this quarantine kind of comes with just this never ending sense of background stress and you don't have that quiet time anymore. And I would suggest, again, if you have that fear of time, it's counterintuitive. But I think one of the best things to do is to intentionally waste time, like spend a few minutes just doing literally nothing, not reading, not checking the news, not playing a video game, just doing nothing and being alone with your thoughts. I think that'll make a bigger difference than you think. For sure. You know how I know you have a toddler? Because I won't shut up about it. (laughs) No, (laughs) because you you said that she sits on your tummy. (laughs) Sometimes I've caught myself when I'm teaching instruction. I'm like, okay, now I'm going to put my hand on his tummy stomach. (laughs) I've done that on the podcast. We had a whole thing about like protecting your tummy at some point. Uh, My instructor says bum, which I think is the cutest thing ever. Bum? Bum. Like he'll be, we'll be talking about how like if you want a bridge, okay, you bring your feet up to your bum and it's like, Dude, you're a grown ass man. Yeah. <laughs> At least when I say tummy, I can say that, hey, I'm just doing toddler speak. But who says bum? Seriously. I've also found that I say potty a lot. Like when I have to go to the bathroom, I say I have to I have to go to the potty. <laughs> you're at a meeting. Hey guys, can I go to the potty real quick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny how much the world changed so quickly. But yeah, I mean, I it's certainly an interesting time because like we simultaneously have less things to do, but it's also a lot more stressful for people. So yeah, I'm sure a lot more people are stressed than me. So yeah. I feel, actually feel really fortunate. And I think a great antidote for chronophobia is just to try to be bored. Yeah, I highly recommend it. And if someone wants to bite the bullet and read that uh, bored and brilliant book and let me know if it's any good, I'd appreciate it. Um, Anything else you want to add on the topic, Matt? No, no, that's good. Yeah, cool. We're out out of time. (laughs) 
So just to re- me out. Yeah, I know. Um, so just to recap today, in terms of the mental models we discussed, self-competition, I think, again, that hedonic treadmill is a big part of why people are afraid of time is because they're always comparing themselves to the people around them and thinking they don't have enough rather than just being happy with what they actually have. We talked about mindfulness, um, intentionally living in the present moment, which is one of the best tools you have for defeating fear of time, both the worry and um, and loss of the past and also anxiety about the future. And we talked about Kaizen, again, a great tool for combating chronophobia because Every action you take, if you're implementing Kaizen, is towards improvement. And regardless of what happened today, if you're ultimately improving every day, it's hard to feel bad about yourself. So again, these things, I hope they were helpful to me, and I hope they'll be helpful to you as well. Matt, want a question? Yeah, let's do one. It's actually not a question, it's a comment. I ordered and installed a Tushy bidet about a week and a half ago. Oh shit, was it on a recommend, my recommendation? I I don't know if it was on your recommendation or if it was just coincidence, but after we talked about the time that you sent our aunt some hardcore pornography by accident... (laughs) Someone wrote in and said, I ordered and installed a Tushy bidet about a week and a half ago, and it's really great. Install was easy, and now I'm used to it. Really like how the clean the bidet makes my taint an asshole. I love, I love how it does. I love how people have just added these terms into their like everyday vocabulary because of us. So the follow up is one hilarious thing that happened though when I was testing it out, video Straight attached. Yeah, and this guy has provided a video of himself installing this thing, and it basically like blasts water like a pressure cleaner right into his face as he's trying to install it and this this is actually a really common thing with uh the tushy and it actually happened to me too and i was expecting it it's because first of all you like so it the water blasts in two directions one is up the asshole the other one is down which actually cleans the water spout so it's it's quite a clever design um and Mm. the the design where that that actually is the bidet that cleans out your taint and asshole is so goddamn overly powerful. Like I'd say you probably need like 5% of the dial. Is but it, it like water the, one of those water pressure cleaners you used to blast like oh, all the crap off your deck? It's insane. It's like a power washer. And um, and another thing is misleading is like when you install it, it looks like the spout is completely pointing down. So you're like, what the hell? This uh, this angle is totally wrong. Like, how is it going to? It looks like it's just going to shoot straight down. But then you use it and it shoots right up at you. So I think that's a really common thing with the with the tushy but it is pretty awesome this sounds like it would lead to like taint sensitivity it sounds like it's going to just like tear the skin right off there so funny enough like i, I i've been talking about it a lot with my buddies <laughs> just been like now hey, they all have this is the days as well <laughs> actually a few of them have ordered it but but one guy was like hey i, I googled this and like it says that it, it it fucks up your flora and your in your butt and like it's bad for you and i'm like yeah if you fucking shoot it like if you use it like an enema that's bad like if you literally clean out you know, all the way up there, but that's not what you're doing. You're just sort of washing the outside and then you give it a little, a little. So it's like, it's not, you're not supposed to actually clean inside your, anyways, getting quite graphic for a jujitsu <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Tushy doesn't even fucking pay us. We shouldn't even be, I shouldn't be defending them so hard, but, uh, but yeah, no, that, that little, that mistake where it, it hits you is common. It happened yeah, to me. That's why knowing the force vector is critical. This is true. (laughs) All right, guys. Well, um, hope this was helpful. Hope this was a good use of your time. Um, Again, if you want to support the show, super appreciated. You can do so on our Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. If you go there and sign up at the silver tier, we've got our game planning series. We just knocked out another episode of that. I really think it's coming together well, and we've got some great feedback on it. So in addition to supporting us, you get access to some more great stuff. At the gold tier, we're also rolling out some other value adds and new stuff that we think you'll find valuable. But really, if you want to give back to the show and help support us, The Patreon is the best way to do it. Additionally, if you go to bjjmentalmodels.com, that's the home base. That's where we've got our database of concepts where you can dig into these ideas further. We also have a contact form there where you can reach out to us and it links off to all of the other stuff that we offer. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash store, which is where you can pick up t-shirts, gi patches, and hoodies. You can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash join to get on our mailing list and you can always hit us up on Facebook or on Instagram. And that's it. Matt. 
I think it's time to get out of this hot box here. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed your time. Nice pun. I'm going to go watch Interstellar again. Yeah, I'm going to go wash my taint. <laughs> All right. See All you right. guys. Peace.